Good morning, Irving Church. Welcome. It is Easter Sunday, and that means He is risen. We're here to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead some 2,000 years ago today. We're going to have a great time singing together and praising Jesus, and we're going to hear a great word uh, about the Easter story from Luke. So I hope you guys enjoy this morning, and let's worship together. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy Just run into it, and they are saying, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are saying, Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. It's great to be virtually with you once again, especially on Easter Sunday, a day of such significance for those of us who proclaim the resurrection of Lord Jesus. I want to invite you to do something with me this morning, whether you're at home by yourself or with your family, uh, with a small group of people, then wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I want you to stop and join with me in affirming the resurrection of Jesus. I picked up on this. I, I think this has a, uh, a longer history to it, but I've been doing it for a number of years with the church in Kentucky. I invite you to respond with me to, that, to the proclamation that Christ is risen. I'm going to say Christ is risen. You say he is risen indeed. Okay? Are you ready? Say it loudly and joyfully and triumphantly. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time, so you can join with me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That's what we proclaim as a church. That's our joy and our strength this morning. This past year, 2019, I read J.R.R. Tolkien's books to my oldest da daughter, Sydney, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Now we've just recently finished watching the movies. We just watched The Hobbit over the past few weeks. Wonderful books and wonderful movies, but especially a line from the movie adaptation struck me as gripping uh, when I was watching it recently. It's at the beginning of the story when the uh, protagonist, the main character, Bilbo, is confronted by Gandalf, and Gandalf gathers a clandestine meeting of dwarves at Bilbo's house against Bilbo's will, and they are inviting Bilbo into a great adventure. And it's an adventure that's going to put his life at risk and give him the opportunity to save lives. It's an adventure that, where he's going to seek great untold treasure. He's going to face goblins and a fire-breathing dragon. It's something that an ordinary, lowly hobbit would not normally expect to get in on. And as he's there, given this opportunity, the dwarves are just taking his house apart, seemingly, uh, eating him out of house and home, treating all his possessions roughly, and Bilbo gets really concerned about his possessions. He's looking at a doily that's special to him and pointing it out. And he's talking about how uh, these dishes are dishes that he's inherited from his mother. And somewhere along the line in there, Gandalf stops and confronts Bilbo with a penetrating question. This is what he says. You've been sitting quietly for far too long. When did doilies and your mother's dishes become so important to you? And with that question, Gandalf gives Bilbo the opportunity to consider the difference in what he has become and in what he was made for and what he could be. Perhaps there's more to life than doilies and dishes and a com comfortable life in the Shire. Perhaps he's made for more. Today, as we turn our attention 
to the resurrection of our Lord, I want to ask you the same question. I want to see if you can be confronted by that same idea. Perhaps we're made for more than we've yet realized. And if that seems like a strange thing to talk about here on Easter Sunday, let me suggest to you that you may not yet have fully appreciated the significance of the resurrection of Jesus in the Scriptures. You see, what you might hear about the resurrection on any given Easter Sunday is perhaps a message on the one hand about how it's all true, how this is great for Christian apologetics. Don't you see? Jesus has been raised, and you can prove it, and it can seem to be a very, very strong historical argument. In fact, it is a very strong historical argument, and that then gives us comfort, and we say, yes, it's true, and we can live and die in light of that reality, and and I'm all for that. I'm in on it. I think that's right. But is that really what we're meant to think about when we come to the resurrection on Easter Sunday? On the other hand, you might hear a sermon about how the resurrection is a heartwarming symbol of general truths. Look, it's spring, and flowers are blooming, and the sun's still shining, and life is going to get better after all. And that's true. But is that what the resurrection is meant to signify in the Scriptures? I want to say to you that that's that's not it at all. That the resurrection in the Scriptures, while it includes those things, is much bigger and better than that. What the resurrection of Jesus means in the Bible is divine disruption. It means that God has entered into our world and spoken definitively about both the past and the future. This means world revolution. This means new life. It means a kind of life that we have not yet even dreamed of. And it gives us the opportunity then to ask, what is it that really matters to me? Am I settling for a life concerned with doilies and dishes. To really appreciate the significance of the resurrection, you have to know something about the biblical story. We're not going to retell it all right now, but let me give you the starting point. Here's the starting point of the biblical story. Sin and death have messed up our world. Now, I'm not so concerned right now about the historical or the scientific details. We can debate those later. I'm talking about the biblical and theological center here. Sin and death have cast a spell on our world and corruption going straight down into the human heart, corruption tearing apart nature itself. Our world is not just inhabited by death. It is now dominated by death. And then along comes the Son of God. And he doesn't come with a vaccine. He doesn't come with a magic wand. Nor does he, on the other hand, raise an army and develop a military strategy to overcome sin and evil and death in the world. None of that actually would have worked. You know what he does? He comes with his life. And he gives his life. And he's raised from the grave by God the Father. And that event changes all of history. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll begin with verse 21. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, there's there's the reversal. Through the one man, sin and death, the world in bondage to it. Through the other man, life and righteousness and peace. The world is turning back the other way because of Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Now, right here, the emphasis is falling on the future resurrection of of 
Christ. Paul is dealing with the Corinthians who were, some of them at least were denying that that was a reality. So he's, he's saying, no, Christ has been raised and he's the first fruits. That means he is the offering, like the agricultural offering of the very first harvest that was offered to God in the Old Testament in lieu of the rest that was to come. Christ is that. He's the first fruits. The rest are going to be raised in the future. But I want to, I want to, Stay with the point here, not just about the future life, which is real, but also about present life. Because what the resurrection means in Scripture is not just that Christ eventually will undo what Adam has done, but it's that Christ is already undoing what Adam has done. Right here in this passage, if you continue reading just a few verses, uh, Paul says that Christ is going to continue to reign. He's destroying all authorities and powers and dominions. And he's going to continue to reign until all his enemies are defeated, death being the very last one. But he's reigning right now. And with his resurrection, life has been unleashed in our world. There is now the beginning of new creation. And we are the bearers of that message to the world. We are the bearers of that life to the world. Eternal life, please hear me on this point. Eternal life in Scripture is not just a quantitative thing. That's what we think of when we hear eternal. We're like, oh, it goes on forever. And that's why a lot of times little kids raised in church, they really don't care much about heaven. And they really don't care much about eternity because it sounds to them like one very, very long and boring day. Perhaps church service or something like that. Eternal life is not just a quantitative thing in Scripture. I would even suggest that it may not be primarily a quantitative thing in Scripture. Eternal life is a qualitative thing. It is a kind of life. It is life from above that it enters into our world through the risen Lord Jesus. And this life then changes everything. Right now, the Spirit of God is producing that kind of life in you. And that's why things are different for you. That's why things are different for me. That's why things are different for the church. And Paul talks about this kind of life all the time. I'm going big picture here uh, this morning. So we're not going to stay with one particular scripture for a long time. I'm trying to give you a big picture of what the New Testament teaches about resurrection life. Okay. Paul talks about it all the time. I'll focus on just a couple of things that Paul says about it. And uh, because we've lost our way, I'm afraid we don't have ears to hear what he's saying. We think he likes to talk in metaphors, or he likes to use flowery language about things that really aren't that practi practical or meaningful in our world. And I want to tell you, that's not it at all. Paul knew more about reality than we do in our enlightened minds today. And when he talks about life, he is talking about the real thing from Jesus Christ, raised from the de dead, unleashed in our world taking up in our hearts, taking up, taking up in our churches. That's what eternal life is. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, where Paul is here talking uh, about his persecutions and his sufferings. And he says, we, himself and those like him, are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Now just stop right there. Do you believe? that Paul meant what he said? He said, I carry around in my body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Now, there's mystery here, and there are things that go beyond our present understanding, but I want you to understand that this is reality. That there's a real kind of thing that has been unleashed in our world through the resurrection of Jesus, brought to inhabit us by the Spirit of God. We're talking about forces, energies, powers. We're talking about the Spirit of God inhabiting us and bringing into our lives something real and powerful. And you may say, well, that's weird. Yeah, it is weird. But you know what else is weird? Being alive is weird. Being a human being is weird. How our own spirit inhabits our bodies is strange. Human consciousness. I remember studying this years ago uh, in a philosophy class. People don't know what to do with human consciousness. It's a great mystery. 
how in the world are we able to process things and be self-aware and self-reflective of things? These things are mysteries. And once you get past the mystery of life itself, human life itself, it may not be that difficult to think, you know, God might be doing something on that life that's in me. God might be unleashing something there in me and in his church that I can't see and put in a test tube. And perhaps the smartest people in the history of the world have actually known about that. Certainly the smartest one of all, Jesus Christ, knew about it. I want you to listen to what C.S. Lewis had to say along these lines. He's talking about putting on Christ, the New Testament language of putting on Christ, taking, taking off sin and putting on Christ. Here's what he says about it. Please, please hear him. Put right out of your head the idea that these are only fancy ways of saying that Christians are to read what Christ said and try to carry it out. As a man may read what Plato or Marx said and try to carry it out. They mean something much more than that. They mean that a real person, Christ, here and now, in that very room where you are saying your prayers, is doing things to you. It is not a question of a good man who died 2,000 years ago. It is a living man. Still as much a man as you and still as much God as he was when he created the world, really coming and interfering with your very self. Killing the old natural self in you and replacing it with the kind of self he has. At first only for moments, then for longer periods. Finally, if all goes well, turning you permanently into a different sort of thing. Into a new little Christ. A being which in its own small way, has the same kind of life as God, which shares in his power, joy, knowledge, and eternity. See, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the life of God being real to us and making a difference in the way we experience life itself. Gradually, sometimes we get sped up, sometimes slowing down, but over time, taking on the life of God, becoming more and more little Christ, as Lewis said, bearing the life of Christ himself in us. That's what Paul's talking about, bearing about in his body the very death and life of Christ, being marked by Christ himself. Let me just make this personal and practical for, practical for you. Eternal life means your liberation is near. Eternal life means that if you've been bound by lust, freedom is at hand. Eternal life means if you've been bound by anger, freedom is at hand. It means if you've been bound by fear, freedom is at hand. That's the kind of life that God has in himself that he's infusing into his people. And if you've been discouraged in your struggle with sin, today let me encourage you, let me tell you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has meaning for you right where you are in your struggles. The life of Christ will grow and manifest itself in you, if you will allow it. But it's not just about putting things off either. It's not just about stopping doing things that we would say are bad or negative. It's about learning to bear the goodness of Jesus. That's what his life really is. It's a life of self-giving love. Look at what Paul says in the next chapter here, in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. He says, the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who for their sake died and was raised. Did you hear what he said? We no longer live for ourselves. That's it right there. It's a flipping around of ordinary life. It's identification with the pattern of Jesus' life itself. No longer living for ourselves, but instead becoming God-oriented people who then are poured out for the sake of others, just like Jesus was. That's the eternal kind of life that comes to abide in us. And Paul, again, is talking about reality. One died for all, therefore all have died. And then we live, but we live a different kind of life. That's the beautiful blessing 
That's what we have to proclaim. We have to say it, and we have to say it strongly because we're in danger of being unbiblical. We're in danger of dismissing some of the most important affirmations that are made repeatedly in the New Testament. We're in danger of not proclaiming the full gospel because we dismiss statements like this that the Apostle Paul and so many others in the early church understood well and knew to take very seriously. We're in danger of missing out on life. Life that comes from above. Our lives are meant to be thrown into the mission with Jesus. To be emptied out for the sake of others. And that's going to look differently for different people. But every Christian should be coming alive. Proclaiming the gospel. Reaching people. Serving people. Helping those who are hurting and weak and poor. The Christian life becomes a life of mission because it is the life of Jesus himself who came on mission into our world. Now you may be saying right now, you know, we're in the midst of the coronavirus and this is a sad time. Luke, why don't you say something to encourage us? I want to tell you that the message I'm proclaiming today is encouragement if you really understand it. Because the message of Easter is not, if you can tough it out through life, it will get better when you die. That's not the message of Easter. That's true. But that's not the message of Easter. The message of Easter is that Jesus has already dealt with death. And that he has already unleashed life into our world. And we can begin living eternal life right now. That's the message of Easter. And in that kind of life, we move in to the next life with joy and peace, of course. But we're not just waiting it out. Saying, well, it's true that something good happened to Jesus a long time ago. And hopefully it will happen to me too when I die. No, right now. Right now that life comes. And makes us alive too. And if that's not true, I'm sorry, the Bible's not true. Because that is what the Bible says. And you can find it true too. We can all find it true if we step into it. By God's grace, he makes himself known to us. And we see that life rising up within us. See, today I can't promise you that you're not going to get sick and die. Well, that'd be encouraging today. When it, nobody's going to get sick and die. But that's never been the Easter message. Have you seen the latest stats that are in? They're now predicting that over 7 billion people are going to die. Everybody in the world's going to die. We can't tell people they're not going to die. I hope they're not. I think most of us are going to make it through the coronavirus. But our message is not that you're never going to die, that you're never going to get sick, you're never going to have things that are hard happen. Our message is that life has been spoken over death. And life has already entered into the world. And believers are living it out. They've been living it out for generations, for centuries. We're called into a life with God now. We're like rugby players carrying the ball for a little while, and then we throw it off to somebody else. And that's our part in this world, the mission of Jesus, carrying it forward with his life. And say, now you take it farther. Every single Christian called into that kind of life. I want to read to you before I close from one of the great early Christians, St. Athanasius. Please stay with me for just a second. Don't check out because I'm reading. This is good stuff. See, Athanasius saw what Jesus was doing. And it was his response to the world around him. Look at what Christ is doing. Look at what he has done and know that it's true. He talks about how Jesus has dealt with death and what a difference that has made. Listen. When the sun rises, let me start back a little bit earlier. Death used to be strong and terrible. But now since the sojourn of the Savior and the death and resurrection of his body, it is despised. And obviously it is by the very Christ who mounted on the cross that it has been destroyed and vanquished finally. When the sun rises after the night and the whole world is lit up by it, nobody doubts 
that it is the sun which has thus shed its light everywhere and driven away the dark. If you see with your own eyes men and women and children even, thus welcoming death for the sake of Christ's religion, how can you be so utterly silly and incredulous and maimed in your mind as not to realize that Christ, to whom these all bear witness, himself gives the victory to each, making death completely powerless for those who hold his faith and bear the sign of the cross. No one in his senses doubts that a snake is dead when he sees it trampled underfoot, especially when he knows how savage it used to be. Nor, if he sees boys making fun of a lion, does he doubt that the brute is either dead or completely bereft of strength. Strength. These can, things can be seen with our own eyes, and in the same, and it is the same with the conquest of death. Doubt no longer then when you see death mocked and scorned by those who believe in Christ, that by Christ death was destroyed, and the corruption that goes with it resolved and brought to end. One more reading from Athanasius. Does a dead man prick the consciences of men so that, they, so that they throw all the traditions of their fathers to the winds and bow down before the teaching of Christ? See, Athanasius is challenging unbelievers to explain what he's seeing around him. If he is no longer active in the world as he must needs be if he is dead, how is it that he makes the living to cease from their activities? The adulterer from his adultery, the murderer from murdering, the unjust from avarice, while the profane and godless man becomes religious. If he did not rise but is still dead, how is it that he routs and persecutes and overthrows the false gods whom believers think to be alive and the evil spirits whom they worship? Athanasius is just talking about what he's seen happen in his world. Did you ever wonder what happened to Zeus? Jesus Christ happened to Zeus. The risen Lord Jesus cast him out. That's why people today name their dogs Zeus. Because of the power of the living Lord. Athanasius saw this happening. For where Christ is named, idolatry is destroyed. And the fraud of evil spirits is exposed. Indeed, no such spirit can endure that name, but, but takes flight on sound of it. This is the work of one who lives, not of one dead. And more than that, is it is the work of God. It would be absurd to say that the evil spirits whom he drives out and the idols which he destroys are alive, but that he who drives out and destroys and whom they themselves acknowledge to be the Son of God is dead. Whom then are we to call dead? Shall we call Christ dead? Or shall we call death dead? The Son of God, living and effective, is active every day and affects the salvation of all. But death is daily proved to be stripped of all its strength. And it is the idols and the evil spirits who are dead, not he. No room for doubt remains, therefore, concerning the resurrection of his body. Listen, the Lord Jesus is in charge. He has been raised from the dead. And Christians have been witnessing his mighty power throughout history. Men, women, and children training to die. It used to be a part of early Christian catechesis to train those coming in to live in preparation of potential death. They were going to be killed. And they've done it, Athanasius points out. They've, they've joyfully at times run to their torture and death. They've given up their idols. They've given up their sin because of the eternal life that's in them. And you can just hear Athanasius asking the same question to the church today. That Gandalf asked to Bilbo, when did you get so concerned about your mother's dishes? When did you start thinking this is all there is to the Christian life? Perhaps you were made for adventure. An adventure with Christ. An eternal life. I'll close with this story. One of the stories about Dallas Willard that I love when he was towards the end of his life and, and going into a precarious surgery. I think it was uh, potentially life-threatening. His granddaughter tells this story. Dallas called her back into the room as they were leaving. And uh, as they were the last two in the room, he said to her, hey, give them heaven. I want to say to you that that is what the church is called to do in the world today. 
the world is longing for the church to give them heaven. That is the kind of eternal life that flows in the people of God that is in us today. May we, in light of the risen Lord Jesus, in light of the truth of the resurrection, go out and give everybody heaven, even now. Amen. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for giving us Jesus. We thank you for giving us your Son so that death would be defeated for us, God. Um, Lord, I pray that in the sight of a defeated death, Father, that we would uh, lay aside our dishes and our doilies, God, and, and, and uh, for the sake of an adventure with you, Lord God. Uh, we want to go on the adventure with you. We want to be used by you. We want to see you move in power. We want to see heaven brought down to earth. God, we want to live in this eternal life that you've purchased for us now. God, we love you and we thank you for the hope that we have and the fact that our Lord is alive. God, we pray that you would send us out in confidence today and let us rejoice in that fact. We love you and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We thank you guys for joining us on this Easter Sunday here at Irving Church. God bless you. Have a great day.